In 2013, the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service entered into a cooperative agreement with the South Dakota No-Till Association and IGRO, SDSU Extension, for delivering the latest soil health and productivity technology to South Dakota farmers and ranchers. A series of two local events were held in South Dakota, in Lemon and Fort Pierre. Well, good morning. I, uh, I want to start the talk this morning by uh, basically uh, I took a clipping out of the Bismarck Tribune, and my wife and I are that age where we still get the newspaper every morning. You know, that's kind of a bygone era, isn't it? Uh, especially for younger people, but we're still that age where, you know, we like to be at the kitchen table, have a cup of coffee, and talk a little bit about the news. And there was one uh, clipping that came out just the other day, very recently in the Tribune, about study finds crop diversity lessening. We, knew, we, we know this, but now there was actually a study completed on this. I think what's kind of disturbing on that all is, is um, when we look at that broader picture, not, not an individual farm in this case, but maybe a broader picture, we, we look at the lessening of crop diversity, and if you've driven through North Dakota lately, uh, you've probably noticed the stacks of tree rows. Okay, so we're taking our tree rows out you probably noticed where there used to be uh, perennials in native rangeland, it's now an annual crop. So you, you really see a changing landscape. When you start looking at those whole, all those aspects and you start adding them together, does that sound like food security to you? I think, I think if we're honest about it, it really doesn't sound like food security and I think that's one of the, the scary items about a changing landscape. Where, when we simplify. If you went to retire today and you took your fortune, let's just say you're Rick Bieber, so you have a very large fortune, and, and you want to retire, and you're going to go ahead and, and the financial uh, planner says to you, I'm going to put this all in one pot right here. You'll be fine. Would you be comfortable with that? Probably not, because everything everything's going to tell you that diversification is going to be the key for that long-term survival. And so it's that way with our food security too. So with the, with the topic today, I think it's a, it's a timely topic. I think it's something we need to be taking a much more serious look at. And I'm going to walk through it today and uh, talk to you about cows on cropland. And, and when I think of uh, covers, I think of them as annuals, biannuals, and perennials. I think of them as all three, and then finding, finding the fit. And so what we're going to talk about in this talk this morning, <clears throat> there'll be a little bit on the perennial aspect of it, uh, a little bit on the biannual, a little bit on the annual, and we'll wrap this thing kind of in a package together. And some items that I want to bring up now for thought, so you're thinking about them as we go through the program. Some livestock considerations, grazing systems, you know, in North Dakota, and especially in Burley County, we principally have used once-over systems and sometimes twice-over systems. The once-over system usually favors more so the resource. The twice-over system, kind of a little more favoring of the livestock end. But the really good ones, it seems, can come together and, and there's a combination in that grazing system of once-over and twice-over on these pastures on a grazing system. And the reason I'm bringing that up with the perennials is if we're going to integrate these livestock, they have to be someplace, right? Before the integration on the cropland, they got to be someplace. And so we have fewer and fewer places for them to be, so I'm going to throw out some options today, some alternatives. Another one is heifer selection. One thing the ranchers taught me that if you want to do a good job on heifer selection, if the, uh, if the uh, calves have their head in a creep trough, that's a difficult heifer selection process because you're going to take them out, put them into a grass environment and expect them to produce a profitable calf and, and raised on creep. That kind of disguises a lot of their strong and weak points. And so a lot of our, a lot of our producers, you know, there isn't going to be any creep on those calves. And that allows a much better selection, heifer selection process, uh, especially when they're going to be on grass. If they're going to stay on grain, that's a different situation. 
And then always keep in mind the 100-day window as we go through the program this morning. Keep in mind the 100-day window for nutritional need uh, for a bread, uh, bread cow or a bread heifer. That 30 days before the calf and 70 days after the calf, what do you got? You, you got the spike in nutritional need and protein and energy. And so you always want to be aware of that as you're looking at integrating livestock. Where are my livestock going to be in that 30 days before they calve and 70 days after they calve? Where are they going to be? In our environment, we like to have them on green grass during that period of time. Cheapest way to meet that need. But if, and if you're going to integrate them onto covers, <clears throat> you want them on the low, the low end of the need, the first trimester and the second trimester. Their nutritional need is much, much lower and we can go ahead and monitor that. And so we always want to be aware of the 100-day window. So those are just some items we'll probably touch on them again at the end as we walk through this and get some idea on why are those cows on your cropland. Um, I was just at uh, Owatonna, uh, Minnesota recently, and we talked about cattle on cropland. And interesting day. And uh, actually probably more acceptance than I was thinking. My wife was in the car and she had it running and I knew where the door was. <laughs> but it was interesting because uh, there was way more acceptance than I was thinking of. And uh, so I think we need to take a look at this thing as we regenerate soils and we take a look at landscapes. Okay, to illustrate the point in the grazing system, uh, I had to walk through this very slowly in Minnesota, but I was told this crowd is quite elevated, both in IQ and other advancements. And so we're really going to fly today, so, okay. So this particular unit, let me see if I've got this on. Looks good. Let's give that a try. No. Yeah. I'm trying that one, and it is on. Let's Ah, that will make quite a difference, I think. We got the receiver now. That's kind of a South Dakota thing. You, you hand it to the North Dakota guy, and then you watch him. <laughs> I see how this game works. OK, thanks. Appreciate it. If, if you're going to move into livestock integration, move into no-till, move into cover crops, think about writing down you know, your, your, your mission statement, why. Write it down. If you, you think about it, that's one thing, but writing it down forces you to really analyze it. Write it down with your family and other partners. This one's pretty straightforward. They also have some other goals where they get a little bit more in depth. And so first half of my career, I didn't bother asking anybody to write down a goal statement. But the second half of my career, I really realized how important that is. And so if you're willing to write down some things, we can really partner and do a lot better job of partnering. Okay, so we know where we're going to go with these scenarios. This is just, in, just their particular goals. They said it's fine to show these to other people. They don't have a problem with that. And so it gives me a good idea on how we can partner. Okay, this was the before on the grazing system. Six pastures and six herds. What does that mean? It means you're going to graze all season long in that pasture, right? And if you have enough forage to get to the end of the season, okay, but there'll be no recovery time, right? It's gonna be no rest recovery time on those grasses. So this was the before, okay? Six herds, six pastures, uh, feedlot weaning, you know, it's a sand site. And so if we look at what we did afterwards, we moved to 30 pastures and we combined to three herds, okay? So now we're building some recovery time. If you have four pastures of equal size and one herd, you're going to have about 75% recovery time, right? Everyone, everyone's with me because three of those pastures are in recovery, all right? It's been my experience over many years. I like to get to 90% plus recovery time. That means more than four pastures, okay? So when I get to 90% plus, I really start to see a lot of these things happen much quicker because now our recovery window is so long and our exposure window is so short, okay? 
So this was the ranch before, the six pastures, the six herds. It looked a little more like this afterwards. It's gone through another change now. He's added six more pastures. But he understands recovery time. So he puts in another single wire. And this is the 90, this is the, the 100 day window. And he's well aware of this 100 day window. So he likes to manage the livestock accordingly so that when we're in that higher need, whether we're gonna be on cover crops or whether we're gonna be on perennial grass, we can have a good chance of meeting their needs and we can monitor the livestock. So that, that's one of the key items that's always important. And they do monitoring as a family. So monitoring is a family activity. Everybody gets involved and does the, man, the, the monitoring. So I, I think uh, little, little William and, and Anna and Linda, they all get together and they, they all have the little process they do. They also monitor pollinators in their cover crops. They put up a 100 foot line and they walk by it and they add up the plants on, on where, there's, where there's bees. And so they monitor also their cover crops. Now their recovery period is 75 to 90 days, so they'll have 75 to 90 days before they come back. Because keep in mind, if you're gonna move your calving to May and June, you're also moving the breeding period, right? Goes right along with it. So now you want those cattle on a good plane of nutrition during the breeding period. And to me, that's where the second grazing on some of these pastures can play a critical role. So the exposure period per week is or per pasture is usually less than two weeks. So generally, less than two weeks uh, between moves. Then he can put high carbon material down or low carbon material down, depending on uh, what he's looking at in terms of the season of use change. And I think there's an advantage as to that as far as cycling. Then when he gets to his covers, this is just uh, one of his mixes, uh, just a warm season mix. And what he does is he weans his calves on it. Okay, so he'll wean the calves on this cover crop. And so the cattle will go back out onto the grazing system and the calves go onto the cover crop. And it kind of makes sense. They're herbivores. You can acclimate them to a feed bunk, but I think they acclimate a little quicker here. And so a lot of his, uh, a lot of his uh, health issues clean up nicely when he gets them out into this environment. It takes them a little while to acclimate. They don't want to walk into it first without their mother. And, and another thing I've learned from the ranchers uh, over the years is the replace, <coughs> replacement heifers, they like to wean them later. Why? Why do, you want to, why do you want to wean the replacement heifer later than the rest? It's more time with mother, right? It, it's that learning environment. So they get more time with their mother and if they get a chance to do some grazing of cover crops with their mother, that's a pretty good replacement heifer. It learns that, it learns those concepts. So they walked around the perimeter a while before they walked inside. They, uh, they like to balance their diet too if they have diversity. If they have diversity, they'll do a pretty fair job of that. And in this particular case on those few acres, 210 calves, we had 187 grazing days per acre. What's a grazing day worth for a calf? That, that you have to decide yourself, but you know, you can get an idea on value, okay? So grazing days is a nice way to put some, you can put your own economics to it. I like to have a surface that kind of looks like that. So when I look down, I don't see soil. I got a nice situation. I got some low carbon, some high carbon materials. I got a nice carbon nitrogen ratio. And we have some ground cover. We can take uh, rainfall uh, compaction out of the game. You know, rainfall onto bare soils, whether they're no-till or any other form of uh, cropping system is an issue. So we can take that compaction energy out of there. And then we had, uh, uh, I always had trouble establishing cover crops on this ranch in the fall. It's high leach sands, very low water holding capacity. He only hold, he doesn't hold much water in a four foot profile. And he always grew some oat pea for forage. So we started, um, instead of putting the cover crops in after harvest, we started putting cover crops into this forage crop. So what we did is we took the, um, the vetch, or annual ryegrass, turnip and radish, and we tucked them in with the oat pea. And the oat pea was already harvested off here, but then in the fall, 
we get a pretty nice cover and we don't have to reestablish or try to establish in a very dry, brittle environment. And so, because it's already an understory, it's already established. And so that was one way this ranch taught me that we can go ahead and get this established a lot easier. And it's only one seeding operation instead of two. So there were some advantages there, but it got the understory in there. It all went in at one time in the spring, but that second line, the second line evolves in the fall. This is his primary forage crop. He still took that, but then we had a nice flurry of, um, of the understory that came in the fall. So it's just another way for us to get a cover in. At the Minokin farm, um, our sheep talk, first of all, and um, this year we had 20 yearlings and we had three sheep. That was our herd, okay? And the day we introduced the two groups, the sheep looked at the yearlings and the yearlings looked at the sheep. What do you think the sheep did? They, they, they moved right toward the yearlings because they're a flock animal. They just moved right to them. What do you think the yearlings did? Turn around and ran, and they put a lot of pressure on a four-wire fence. I thought it was going to go. It was a lot of pressure on a four-wire fence. So we introduced them. It took them a couple of days to acclimate to each other, and after that, they were just, they ne nobody went anywhere without the entire group. So that was our herd. And, and uh, I want to go through a, a scenario here with introduced perennials, which is another alternative for us. And, and take a look. This was seeded in the fall of 14. So in the fall of 14, we put the cool seasons in. And then in June, we put the warm seasons in. And then in 15, we grazed it. It was kind of interesting because we had seven Holsteins and 13 Red Angus. <clears throat> the seven Holsteins were pin raised. And when they got into the grazing system, they went into the cell center by the water tank where there's a fence around the cell center. They went in the cell center and laid down. Didn't want to come out. It felt comfortable. You know, they were pin raised. So they found the nearest thing that looked like a pin and they went and laid down in it. Once the red Angus got introduced with them, then everybody went out to graze. But, so we can, we can establish rotational we can establish, uh, at the Minokin farm, we have rotational uh, perennials. And this allows us then to run the grazing system again. If we're going to integrate them, we've got to have them somewheres. So I don't have native rangeland, but I can put some introduced species in, and I can do pretty well on this. So it's a 12-acre field. They get an acre, they get an acre at a time. Okay? And so we'll put them an acre at a time. That's enough for about three days. And so we kind of do this based on quality of life. That way nobody has to move them over the weekend. The move is real, real easy. It's just a single wire electric. And we like to take a look and leave some material on the surface in this environment as well. And the other thing that I like, um, I like to go in there and just sit down and let them come over. And once they're past the curiosity stage, they start to graze. And then I like to see what they're grazing. What are you taking? What aren't you taking? So we start to get a little better idea on this whole preference thing as well. So that's just me sitting there observing them. And I like to have good ground cover when I'm done. And so we, again, I don't want to see ground. I don't want to see bare soil. And so we'll get a pretty good, pretty good amount. Uh, we'll let them take 30, 40, even up to 50%. And the rest I like kind of on the soil surface. Uh, not exactly all, because if you're going to manage for wildlife at all, and you want to have uh, maybe nesting as a concern, uh, then, I, then I might not want a complete trample. I might want to back off on that some, and I'll go ahead and I'll have more of a mixed height. So we can do some different things in, with time. And then they got to be somewheres until you need them at a particular point. And this is a, this is a warm season cover crop, so I'm coming in here and I'm topping it. So I'll let them take the top half off, and then I'm going to take them off and then let it regrow. And then we'll try to do a little monitoring of uh, carbon on there as well and see if we impacted carbon because if we get the plant to regrow, we can get this longer period of time to harvest CO2 out of the atmosphere and get the carbon into the soil. So there's some advantages. Can you see the cowbirds and blackbirds following that herd? So they're just on a, that's about a, that's about a nine species mix of warm season plants, okay? And so they're in there, they're in there topping it, and again, about an acre a day. 
on cropland. This is uh, the cool season mix. And so you can see the Holsteins uh, played the role of scout. They could look around and see forever. The red Angus are in there. You can see the tops of them. And the sheep, take, take my word for it, the sheep are in there too. Okay, You just can't see them. But this is the cool season mix. I'm going to come in there and top it. So we're going to take off. Uh, do you think they're going to be on a pretty good plane of nutrition? Yeah. Yes. They're going to be on a great plane of nutrition. Next summer, we're going to have the capability to weigh. Didn't have that capability this past summer, but I was working off of grazing days. But this coming summer, we're going to have the capability to weigh. And so it's going to be interesting to monitor the weights on them before and after going into these, into these different mixes because that allows us to take a look at this whole uh, production of a pound of beef. In the fall, we brought in uh, from one of the neighbors, we brought in some pears, some fall calvers. And this is some of the regrowth of what was harvested earlier. Okay, So earlier we had the, the yearlings and sheep in here and we topped it. And then in the fall, we got the regrowth portion coming. Annual rye, brassica, hairy vetch. If you want to see livestock bloom up nicely, uh, get, them on, uh, get them on an annual rye grass. They will do very nicely. And if you have a combination of plants like this, it allows a little more, I think, a little bit better job of um, uh, plant diversity for their selection. And I think their ration is a bit more complete. But they did a nice job of, uh, they, they, they really bloomed up really nicely when they got into this environment. So again, it's cropland, but it's the second grazing part. So I can get some grazing days on the first scenario. I can get some regrowth. I can come back. I can get some additional. McPeak grass and cattle. Again, we've got to have the cattle somewheres. And what this ranch taught me is that we can go ahead and have cattle for long periods of time on our hayland during the winter. And so something Dwayne Beck taught us years ago, he said we got to get legs on the cattle. We got this high tunnel. This is a quick Dwayne Beck story. We got, we got this high tunnel at the Minokin farm for the gardening portion. Okay? Inside the high tunnel are our feed bunks. We got the legs back on the cows. No longer needed the feed bunks. Now they're in high tunnels. So how you, how you can always find another use for these items. So, <clears throat> so putting the legs back on cattle, the cattle used to be wintered at the headquarters on this ranch. Okay? And so they would winter 500, 500 head at, at the headquarters. And one day they wanted to know why the grazing system in drought periods was doing so much better than the hayland system. Well, on hayland, our classical production model is one of exporting, right? We, we windrow it, we bale it, we take it off, it's fed somewhere else, right? So on this particular ranch, they changed all that. They roll out the bales, and so if the bales came off of 40 acres, it's rolled back over 40 acres over the course of the winter. If it came off of 80 acres, it's rolled back over 80 acres over the course of the winter. And so it's, everything, is, everything is recycled 75% plus of what comes in the front end of the cow comes out the back end. So that allows us to recycle a lot of nutrient, a lot of N, P, and K, a lot of carbon, minerals, vitamins. <clears throat> Whole different line of thinking. The bales become the uh, bio windbreak. He's, he has water, or they have access to water as well. And this allows him to go ahead and feed different location every day and recycle everything back. There's no cattle in the headquarters. And he explained to me, he said, he said, it's no colder here than it is on the yard. And I said, I understand. So here he's got four pastures in a row. You can't see the division fences in here, but there's four in a row here. It's recycling on hayland. So they're going to spend the winter on the hayland. If you're going to have cattle, you're going to integrate them somewhere. They've got to be somewhere, right? Here they can be on the hayland until it starts to warm up. He's done this since two, he started uh, the winter of 11-12. So he started with 155 bales. You can see his progression. This is a 75-acre field. It uh, improved his production one bale per acre. It was just a change in management. 
A bale an acre maybe, maybe doesn't mean much to some people. To us, it's a big item. That's a big item. That's a lot of production. And it didn't come out of a container. You know, it was applying management. And understanding that the carbon is the big food source for the soil. When, uh, when groups come through the Minokan farm, last summer we had 24 groups come through the Minokan farm, about one a week from wherever. And uh, sometimes we'll stop out at this ranch. And uh, we'll get out the canister rings and we'll do infiltration. Okay, so the first inch, anybody want to guess what the infiltration is on that place? That's really close. It was 15, were you there? It was, it was, it's 15 seconds for the first inch. The second inch, it really slows up, it goes to 18 seconds. That's infiltration. But he's got a lot of carbon, carbon for the biology. The biology builds the aggregates and the pore spaces and we start to improve infiltration, okay? A little biology, this was where we started. Nanograms per gram biology, that number doesn't really mean much when you first get the number because there's not exactly a book to go to, so you kind of build it with time. You start taking a look at it with time. After three years, we were averaging quite a bit higher, but we also had more respiration and we had more carbon after three years, okay? Soil monitoring is only good when you start to get usually a, a number of years uh, behind you, so that was after three. After four years, the biology is looking pretty high. The infiltration's high now, but the carbon now is in the 300s. It's come up quite a bit. So when you have more food, you typically get more biology. So it's like a civilization. You give a civilization more reliable food and diverse food, and they typically flourish, and then they respire more as well. So now after five years, now you start taking a look, uh, what we've done more recently now is we are starting to take a look at the NP and K production per cow per day, okay? Because there's some pretty good data on this, especially out of the University of Saskatchewan with uh, Dr. Bart Lardner. And so he's been to North Dakota and we visited with him a bit and, and we can actually take a look at and decide how long we want to leave them on a field because we know what we're going to generate then for NPK, et cetera, coming out of those bales. And there's no reason to go beyond a certain point because you'll always have a weaker link somewhere else. And you can move the cattle to the weaker link, start to bring those areas up, and then maybe come back to one of these in a year or two. So there's different ways to monitor that. But here's the place where the cattle can be for a considerable period of time. So the beauty of North Dakota in the wintertime besides our scenic landscape. But the beauty of it all is, you know, when you freeze that hard, that deep, it's a beautiful place for livestock. I mean, it is just, it's just made for it, so. Interesting scenario. These are the forage analysis the ranch completed, and this line right here is the ones that are recycled. This is where the recycling occurs. These other locations are owned our uh, rented land and the landowner won't allow him to feed on the hayland, okay? So what's happening with nutrient density? Now we got higher protein and higher energy. Where we're recycling, we have higher protein and higher energy in the next year's feed. Kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Now just, this is a rancher observation, but he's told me on a number of occasions when they get into these fields, they eat less. So you get into the whole nutrient density, get a peek at it with livestock. This is uh, PLFA, this is uh, out of Ward Labs, and Lance knows a lot more about this than I do, but I'm just gonna make one or two quick points. Here's my numerical weight, a little over 8,700 nanograms. Okay, that's, that's one of the highest I've seen in the county. That's, that's really high for us in our environment. And the other thing, Every line is populated. There's no zeros. You know, we've got, um, we've got saprophytic fungi, we've got um, mycorrhizal fungi, we've got protozoa, we've got bacteria. Every line's populated. Now I'm gonna show you a follow-up one. This one is about 1,100 nanograms. 
Okay, this is the farm I work with. This is uh, potato production. This is one year after bay pamming. Okay, everybody with me on that? The, that's a soil sterilant, so one year after a soil sterilant. Okay, now let's take a look and see what we got. Now we got, we're showing some zeros in the analysis. And the reason I'm working with this particular farmer is because the residue isn't decomposing. Okay, yeah, so it's not, it doesn't, and he said it doesn't matter if he plows it, disks it, shreds it, leaves it lay on the surface. He said the residue just isn't decomposing. If you can't decompose the residue, the verticillium wilt, you know, is an issue with potato production in North Dakota. And so it's very important that the residue cycle. Well, when you start taking portions of the soil food web out, it's very difficult because that's your decomposers, especially, the, especially saprophytic fungi. And so here we have a scenario where we're going, our attempt is going to be to build this back. So, but I just put that in here kind of as a comparison. This one's the ranch, the McPeak Ranch. You can see the higher uh, amount of the soil food web. You can see there's no zeros. And then with the potato production, yeah, we, we got to work on that. But that's one use, Lance, that we're using for the PLFA that really paints a picture. Uh, Black Lake Ranch, uh, Mr. Doan's been here in this building before, and uh, he continues to move down this road of soil health and livestock integration. And if you had a chance to listen to him, uh, where he has grown the covers, uh, with more frequency, we start to get a little higher populations. And where we grow them with less frequency and more annuals, we got lower populations. So I've seen this. Typically, when we take the cover, the following years of monoculture, we'll see it start to come down. And you go back to combination of plants, it typically is going to rise again. Okay? And so it's looking for more of a uh, consistent food supply. This is just one of his covers, but his covers are full season covers, so they go in in June. This past year, the ranch put in 700 acres of full season covers in their cropping system. The entire cropping system, I'll be a little off on this, but it's probably around 22, 2300 acres, maybe just a little over that. But this year, about 700 acres were put into covers. And you're saying to yourself, how can you afford to do that? And I think his answer would be, I can't afford not to. Because this is some of the most profitable acres on the ranch. But you've got to be thinking multiple income streams, okay? Because before the livestock come in for winter grazing, it's used in the hunting enterprise. And then <clears throat> once the hunting enterprise is over, the livestock come in, and there's a, roughly about five different areas or segments or fields, if you will, that they graze through, okay? And so it allows them to come in and, and you want them, you don't want them to have access to everything at once because then you know what would happen between the first period of grazing and the second period of grazing. You'd have quite a reduction in protein and energy. And so you want to balance that out. These are May, June calvers, so we have a pretty good situation there. And it allows them to be a herbivore. The other thing that's really interesting, the ranch has a real history of uh, rounding up livestock with an airplane or checking them with an airplane. And he said, my cows, he said, are notoriously, he said, they just spook at everything. He said, mostly because there's a plane 10 feet above their back. He said, makes them really jumpy. Well, and we're out here one winter and we're just walking out there with them. It was the most relaxed setting you can imagine. He said, I can't believe they're not bolting. He said, they're just all standing out here grazing. So it kind of changed their demeanor a bit as well. Now, you gotta be taking a look again, where are we at? Uh, nutritional, nutritional balancer to me is a good tool. If you're gonna integrate livestock, nutritional balancer would be a great tool. Send the manure sample in to Texas A&M. You, know, you freeze it, send it in to Texas A&M, fill out their body condition score and that type of information, and you get a read back in regards to protein and energy, okay? So we do that, and then we also do some forage analysis both. And so nutritional balancer, I also like to take it at the end of the grazing in a particular uh, cover crop field. I don't like to do it at the beginning. I like to do it kind of toward the end and see, you know, what are they doing? How are they doing toward the end? Well, you can see on our protein, our protein was holding pretty good over those analyses. 
energy in those particular years as well. And then you look at what their needs are. Now, they were, again, they were not in the window, so they were more in the mid, okay? So were the, was their protein being met? Yeah. No need to supplement protein probably in that environment. Was their energy being met? Pretty close, pretty close, okay? And so you start looking at monitoring, no different than monitoring soil. The cows tell you a lot of And so we can get a pretty good feel for how are they doing. If you're going to integrate them and use them in the wintertime, how are they doing? I think that's really important. The Oswald Ranch, how are we doing on time? Um, I guess, okay, okay. The Oswald Ranch um, uh, set aside cropland this year planted covers on it, and uh, did some grazing on a portion of it. So they turned in on July 6, turned out on July 9. Audrey Rose is the, uh, the herds, herds lady. She does a really good job. So we take a look at the mixture. So it's just, again, a mixture of plants, spring seeded, single wire electric, harvested. His goal was to harvest 30 to 40 percent of it, top it, okay, let it regrow. And the other portion over here was not grazed, okay? So we had grazed, not grazed. We had 150 pair out there on 10 acres for three days. So we picked up 45 grazing days on the first go around, okay? And then the second go around was in, I believe, toward the end of November. I went out and took a little soil monitoring. Now this is just one year's worth. I don't hang my hat on one year's worth. Did we have a change where we uh, grazed versus where we didn't for the uh, biology? Yeah. Did we have a change on the carbon? Yeah, a little bit. And we had an upward movement in the respiration, the respiration of the biology and the root mass to the soil surface. So I want to monitor that again next year so we start to get a little bit more information. When I start to get a few years of soil monitoring, I feel more comfortable with it, but this is just one year's. Bird Ranch, we'll probably finish with this one um, so we can have a little bit of time for Q&A if we want. Uh, I didn't really see this one coming, but um, a lot of the ranches um, just started planting full season covers with the thought of winter grazing. And some of them have planted an acre per pair. So that's about what this one did. Uh, this is about a 90 acre field and he's got about roughly 90 pairs. And, uh, it gives them a nice supplement, so he winter grazed half of that cover crop. After he was done winter grazing it, he fed on a portion of it, rolled out bales on a portion of it, okay? And so that, so what we did is we came in, again, this is just one year's monitoring, but we went to the wheat field, his wheat field, which has no covers and no livestock on it. Then we looked at the cover crop where he just grazed the cover, then we looked at where he grazed the cover and he fed on, okay? And so to me, carbon, the water-soluble organic carbon is an item to look at as well as any of the other tools. And we start to see some different things occur. And, and what it shows is, you know, of course, when we can use to, uh, livestock as a tool to recycle, the interesting thing is you can look at them as very efficient or you can look at them as very inefficient. To me, they're very efficient because 75% plus is gonna to return to the soil. I think of that as very efficient. Now the next person might look at that as very inefficient. But because of that, we have a tremendous tool here to use for building soils, bringing more carbon to the soil surface. So we're probably gonna end with that right there. And uh, if we have uh, some questions, we can visit a little bit. I just kinda of wanna to touch back on some of the points we talked about before we started. Again, uh, the grazing system from the viewpoint of a once-over or twice-over, to me, so many of the ranches end up somewhere with both. They'll graze some of the pastures once, I'm talking perennials now, and they'll graze some of them twice. And if we have adequate recovery time, that second grazing can be strong, and it also is a little higher protein and energy. And so when you're looking at your breeding cycles, uh, anybody ever have any issues with second calvers? I mean, that's always the one that we kind of work on because it seems like that's the herd 
that typically you have the most conception issues with is those that are coming in to be second calvers. That allows us to maybe look at bringing them on to a higher plane of nutrition with the second time around. So we'll have some of those pastures where we want to graze them a second time, bring that up the next year, might be, just be grazed once, and we'll move the second graze pasture somewhere else. So it's a, it's a management item. So I just wanted to mention that as a livestock consideration. Heifer selection, if mama can graze with that calf in some covers, because there's selection in there, and the mother's got to train it and teach it on the selection, on the higher protein, the higher energy. I think there's value in that. And a little longer period of time with the cow, I think there's value with that. When you had teenagers in your house and they were 14 or 15, did you kick them out? Tell them they have to go out into the world? You maybe wanted to, but you kept them, right? And so they went out into life a little later. And it's kind of that way with, with, uh, with, the, with the heifer replacements. I think if they get a little more time with their mother, it's always stronger. The other thing I've learned from the ranchers, when the heifer herd, they're bred heifers and they're wintering, I was out on the McPeak Ranch the other day, and there was this behemoth walking out with these bred heifers. And I said, what's the story there? Oh, that's Jack. Well, I said, tell me about Jack. Well, Jack's the steer, and, and uh, he said, we just keep it with the heifers. And he said, the, he's six years old, so he's the adult. And he said, the bred heifers, they're kind of like teenagers. And he said, it's a calming influence, and it takes away stress. And, and when it's time to move them somewhere, Jack just walks and the rest get in line. And he said, I, I do it for stress. And he said, stress is disease and disease costs me money. And, and so it was interesting to watch. And, and he said, last year, he said, we were gonna take Jack to the slaughter plant, but we couldn't get him through the, he's well over 2,000 pounds, he's a semitol, well over 2,000 pounds. He said, we couldn't get him through the facilities uh, shoot. So they said, take him home. So he said, I happily took him home. And he said, he's going to die on the ranch someday. But, but that kind of thinking, I think, is, is too, is something that we used to probably have more of, but it's still so important. So the heifer selection, May, June calving, if you're going to do that, keep in mind, when, when are you going to be turning the bull in, what's your plan of nutrition at that time, because you could use second grazing pastures or you can use covers or you can use, there's ways to bring up protein and energy that might be helpful before the bull gets turned in to improve conception rates if that's an issue. And then the 100 day window, always keep that in mind. 30 days before, 70 days after, I think that's really important. And myself, I think of covers as annuals, biannuals and perennials and where or what fits is different on, on every ranch. So uh, with that, uh, just if we've got time for a question or two, Ruth, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Yep, okay. okay, good. Jay, the, the concern is nitrate on covers. Yep. And especially when you go on here a little bit early. And then the second question, I hear, hey, I'm gonna give you two at once. Yep. There is, uh, why do you go so many species? I mean, how okay. do you get it done with less species? Okay. Uh, Let's take the first one first, uh, nitrates. Um, I like a lot of pearl millet in my mixes. Uh, in lieu of maybe a sedan sorghum cross or something like that, I still use the sedan sorghum, but then it's a lesser amount, and the pearl millet is more forgiving in that arena. And so the other thing that, uh, just, this is just observation now, but when you're in one county for forever, you get a chance to see some things. And we, when, before we moved into the combinations, it wasn't uncommon for something to die from prussic acid or nitrates, or at least that would maybe, without posting it, but maybe what the vet considered was the issue. And once we went to the combination and they have a chance for uh, diversity selection, really went down. So it's another reason why I like a lot of diversity. It's so much safer grazing and um, you know, when you bring them into 100% uh, sedan sorghum, and maybe you got prussic acid, maybe you got nitrates, what's the choice, you know, what's the choice for that steer? He's going to either die because he's not eating or he's going to die because he eats it well. You know, he's, he's going to eat it, even though everything inside of him might be saying don't, okay? 
but if he has diversity selection and, and then pearl millet I think has kind of been our friend. Uh, we like to have a certain amount in there and that really helps. So that's one of the reasons I like to see a bit more diversity. I guess the other reason is I've always used native rangeland as our template and our native rangeland, you know, we can still find 50 plus, 75 plus, 100 plus species depending on where we're at in the county. And so that tells me that that, that diversity, so if I put eight or 10 species in a cover, I, I, in comparison to what I see in the native rangeland, I don't see it as excessive. Now I think you have to weigh that out with what you are equipped to handle. You know, what's your labor, what's your facilities, that all weighs in there, yeah. Any other questions? South Dakota people. I grew up just, uh, you know, not too far, uh, right on the state line between North and South Dakota. So this feels a little bit like home. Yes, sir. Uh, agronomically speaking, do you think it's better to let the cows go and pick what they want and then leave the more high carbon parts and plants for residue or confine them and make them eat? Yeah, the you can control that, uh, you know, with, with um, uh, the impact of the herd on how dense you want to run them and how short a period of time. So if you want to run a lot in for a short period of time, you know, you're going to get a fairly uniform topping. If you decide to leave them in there for a longer period of time, they're probably going to, you know, pick out the more fines and the higher proteins, et cetera. Well, normally I'm, I'm, I kind of lean toward, I like quite a few head for short periods of time. I don't like leaving them on long periods of time because the CN ratio on the mixture starts to change then and I end up with a lot of high carbons and not much low carbons on the soil surface and it can slow up my nutrient cycling. Uh, there's different ways to, to do that. I don't know that, you know, identify your goals and I think it'll sort out then which way you want to go. I like, I like quite a few head for shorter periods of time. But now if I'm in nesting season, I might do some changes there. I might, uh, I might not leave them in as long, or I might go in on a bigger area. And because they're not going to go hunt for that nest to, to walk on, if you allow them uh, the opportunity, they'll go around it. And so I, sometimes I'll weigh in some of those items as well. But I don't think there's really a right or wrong there. It kind of depends on what your goals are. But I lean a little more toward higher densities myself. Yes, sir. Yeah. Ground, yeah. Uh, could you talk maybe a little bit more about that? Okay. What, I, what I've observed over the years, <clears throat> if I have um, bare soils and it's a no-till system, I'm going to compact. I'm going to get some compaction just because the rainfall is such a heavy contributor to compaction. If I have um, uh, residue to take the energy out of that rainfall, uh, because you get to be an old man, you don't have much hair on top of your head, you walk out in those rains, you really notice it. But, but it is a lot of compaction. And so this is something that's pretty well established. I mean, we, we know this, it's a, big, it's a contributor, it's not the only item, but it's one of the contributors to, to compaction. So if we have some residue. At the Minokin farm, I have a um, no-till wheat field. It's been no-till wheat since 09, okay? And I also have access to some tilled soils with low crop diversity. I put those in the rainfall, the tabletop runoff. Have you seen the tabletop runoff? Okay. I can run off. There won't be much difference between my tilled site and my monoculture no-till site. They'll both run off just about the same amount of water. And, you know, you start looking at this whole thing on carbon and cover and, and you know, it'll run it off cleaner but it really speaks to diversity. And so you start looking at, you know, diversity of residues equates to diversity in the soil food web. And so, uh, so that whole thing starts in and then you get back to this gentleman's question on how much residue on the surface. And that depends on how active that biology is. If you got 1,100 nanograms of biology, it's probably gonna be really slow. And especially when you're missing parts of it. If you got eight, 9,000 nanograms, it's going to go pretty fast. So, you know, it, it all connects. But, but there are bare soils. Bare soils are an issue whether you're no-tilling them or whether you're whatever you're doing. They're just, they're a compaction issue. Yes, sir. Yep. I, I like, uh, it's one of the reasons I like to bring in a large number of head for a short period of time. 
And so I like to bring them in. And if I'm, if I'm summer grazing and the plant's green, that's got a lot of load-bearing capacity because it's a green plant, whether I'm driving on it with a tractor or whether the livestock are on it, okay? If I'm in there in the wintertime, most of our covers, this is the first time we really started summer grazing them. Most of our grazing in, in that area is wintertime grazing, just like today. I'm very comfortable with that. It's five, six feet frozen deep. We're looking pretty good. And, but, but if you're going to graze during the summer, I think there we got to be, there we got to manage to a higher degree. So you're talking about pulling the livestock off during a three-day period of rain? If we got into a three-day period of rain at the Minokan farm, I'd move them onto the perennials. I would, I, I would and I do. Yes, sir. Can you repeat your question? Oh, the question was in, in terms of uh, compaction with livestock. So if you didn't hear the question, it was in terms of livestock creating compaction. In our old systems, first half of my career, in that area, uh, after harvest, we'd have livestock on for two, three months. And we would have trails. And we would chisel plow those trails and, I mean, you know, this whole thing, you know, because we, we didn't really manage it. We just opened up some gates and we walked away from it. And we didn't worry about their plain and attrition and we didn't worry about compaction because we were going to till it. And so, you know, it's a whole different thought process that we're into now when you understand more of the biology of the soil in terms of building soil aggregates and infiltration. Because yeah, infiltration is just one of the keys for production agriculture. Got to have it. I started to mention to well, one last question. Are you running your electric fence behind the cattle? Uh, not, not typically. Uh, depends on what we're doing and where our water is. Uh, the, the question, thank you, Ruth, <laughs> just keep talking to me, I'll figure it out. The question was, are we running a back fence? So we move the cattle, are we running a back fence? And, and uh, sometimes, depending on where the water is, uh, sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. Typically, they don't go back on that much anyway, because, you know, they've already defecated on it and they've already grazed it. But sometimes we will run two fences also. We've done that a number of times as well. And I like that system as well. Yeah. But we've done both. Single wire electric is, you know, it's like a wedding ring, right? Psychological barrier. <laughs> Everybody understands that? Right? Okay. Yeah, we've done the swath grazing. Um, we don't have a lot of swath grazing in the county. But we, oh, Ruth, you were supposed to tell me to repeat. Okay, sorry. Uh, the question was uh, swath grazing. And we do have some swath grazing, not a lot. Uh, we have more bale grazing than swath grazing. But I like swath grazing as a tool uh, with a warm season species planted later in the year. And uh, usually we can maintain pretty good quality on that situation. If we can open up the end of the swath, the way they go. And, I mean, it's an old concept, but it's... I think it still plays a role, and I, I, I like swath grazing. The, the question you start looking at is, um, well, you, you look at something like Black Lake Ranch where they, they don't windrow it, and so you don't have the cost of windrowing, you don't have the cost of baling, and those type things. The local college, Bismarck State College, has a, a farm management portion of the college, and they do the books for the ranch. And they said the, they figured the cost savings at 88 cents a day per cow. Now they still put up some bales, but they haven't fed a bale for three years. But they still put it up. So now, and there's partners in the ranch, and now some of the partners are saying to the old man, they're saying to him, you know, we need to quit these bales or sell these bales or whatever. And he said, no, that's your insurance policy. And so, you know, you gotta, you gotta work with your partners and your groups. Uh, which brings me to one more comment. Um, Another thing I never saw coming was the number of people, uh, livestock people and cash grain people that uh, have started to look at some partnering. And so we got some pretty good partnering going on in a couple situations and I think that's got potential. You don't have cattle, but you know, you got the cash grain, you got the cattle and man, it can be a win-win I feel, but they got to sit down and talk and it has to be worked out. You know. Last comment. Um, I was starting to say I grew up on the state line south of uh, Strasburg, North Dakota, and north of 
area in South Dakota, right on the state line. So I went to high school in Strasburg, North Dakota. And uh, in the 60s, um, Lawrence Welk would come to the school. And everybody would go down to the gym, and it would be an afternoon of polkas and waltzes. Because um, what you saw on TV, that's a, that is exactly the person that came. I mean, that's how he was. And uh, I wish now, in 2016, when I think back about that, I wish I would have had the uh, forethought uh, of more appreciation of what was happening, of what, you know, because it wasn't uh, just an everyday thing. You know, here this person came in with the largest running television show in history and comes in like you couldn't tell them from the janitor. I mean, you know, they were just both there. And, and uh, now when I look back at it, but us guys at that age, you know, and we were in high school, and this is like in 68 and 69, and Tommy James and the Shondells was big, and that's who we thought was cool. And so Crimson and Clover would way outweighed Lawrence Welk. But now when I look back at it, yeah, man, what an opportunity. And I'm appreciative that I was there, but I wish I'd had more awareness uh, to be thinking of the magnitude of it all. But appreciate coming to uh, Pier and Fort Pier to visit with you folks. So thank you very much. <laughs>